Welcome to chapter 7 of Services Marketing. This chapter we're looking at the service recovery. Now service recovery is an area where there's been a bit of work done in practice and in theory and we have a couple of unusual elements that come through here. Now the first of these that I want to draw your attention to is the idea of the service recovery invoking a delight response from a customer after what was going to be outside of the zone of tolerance is retrieved and recovered and this brings back a stronger, more positive response. We'll talk about it when it happens, but there is a key thing here that this was misunderstood by a lot of services marketers as an excuse to get things wrong because when we get it right on the second go, customers will be happier. Alas, it doesn't work that way, so we can't do it that way. So what we're going to look at for this chapter is what happens when a service fails, what you do to attempt a recovery process, and the importance of understanding fixing the problem as it's arisen, fixing the customer as they've been disadvantaged, and then going back and retrieving and recovering why the problem took place and fixing the service design to prevent future problems. So when we look at this chapter, when we're looking at your key points and highlights that you want to take away from it when you're reading the text is complaints and complaining behavior. Why do people sometimes not complain? Why do people complain to parties other than the service provider? And what do you do if you're in a set of circumstances where the customer is lodging complaints, but they're lodging them to third parties? So the first you hear about a problem with your service is a bad review on the press or a negative write-up on Yelp that you didn't actually get a chance to address this problem with the customer. So when we talk about service marketing, we talk about reliability. We know that we've got the RATA mechanism and reliability is key, but we also have one of the intrinsic values and elements of services marketing is inconsistency. So service failure happens when there is the gap existing between the expectation and the performance, and it's in the negative, that your performance as perceived is below what the customer expected. Obviously, this raises a couple of quick questions. Top of the list is, is the customer expecting something realistic? Is their expectation reasonable? Second on the list is, what do we do if an expectation hasn't been met, we've delivered the service as we thought it should be delivered, but it hasn't met the customer's needs. What are our service recovery options? So we know that in recovery, we create the service recovery paradox, where something has gone wrong. You have had an initial breach of the zone of tolerance. What was expected? was below, what was perceived was below what was expected. You then activate a second service perception event. So you've got a second zone of tolerance in the service recovery. If you exceed the customer's expectations on what the recovery should be, you will create a super satisfaction. You'll create the service recovery paradox because you've turned a negative event to a positive event, but you've only been able to do this if the customer has complained at the time, if you are in a position to actually respond appropriately, and if your response handles the empathy. Your response has the responsiveness, so it's timely, it's fast, there's empathy, and there's some takeaway. There's some evidence to the customer that this problem is being taken seriously and will be redressed not just for them, but will be prevented from recurring in future. Now the thing about a service recovery paradox is you don't want to do this. You don't want to trigger it. You don't want to intentionally start it. It comes about because some of the times the service failure is not as severe there's a loyalty to the firm. The 
failure? Can they also come from the point where people go, yes, there's been a service failure, but that was outside of the control of the service provider. For example, an airline that gets passengers onto a plane, the airport gets shut down due to an electrical storm, and this happens in Sydney on a regular basis during summer. The electrical storm shuts down the airport, the plane is grounded, the passengers are stuck on the plane. The service recovery whilst on that aircraft by the crew on the aircraft can often be create that service recovery paradox of super loyalty because the circumstances are unfortunate, but the customers are not attributing blame to the airline. They're attributing blame to the circumstances, but they're still receiving a level of delight. It's exceeding their zone of tolerance for the service recovery. But if the customer thinks that you had complete control over the cause of the failure, the failure was system systemic or systematic, and this is not the first failure, there is going to be no service recovery paradox. You're going to struggle to actually achieve service recovery. So what happens during service failure? First incident is service failure. It goes wrong. Something breaks. There's a miscommunication. It doesn't work. The customer's reaction splits into they've had a negative response. So you have dissatisfaction, negative emotions. People are unhappy. And it splits into the choice of they can complain or not complain. And that's the first point. In a complaint action, they can just walk away. So you've gone, you've queued up, the person in front of you is taking forever to make their order, you can go, no, it's nothing I can say, there's nothing I can do, but I'm out. And you walk away, it's an exit. Or you can go, look, I'll just ride, it doesn't matter, I'll ride it out, stay. Alternatively, you can go to the complaint action. So you've gone to a restaurant, you've ordered your meal, your meal's taken forever to come out. Your meal has had something wrong with it. It's kind of, it's been delayed, it's come out cold. You can basically just pay and go, or you can say, there's a problem, we're gonna go complain. You can complain to the provider, say, hey, this meal's cold, or you can complain, post a sharp review on Yelp, or Depending on the severity, you can take third party action. You can complain to a health board to get the restaurant inspected. As a consequence of all three complaints, you still also have the opportunity to stay or exit. You can leave the firm or you can maintain your relationship with the firm. So what are the types of complaints that we're going to deal with as customers, as services marketers? The passive complainer, they don't see a point in complaining. Uh, what difference is it going to make? They'll take their business elsewhere, but they won't say anything to you, so you learn nothing from them. The voicer will complain to you. They will come to you and say, hey, there is a problem. But they believe that there is efficacy and value in complaining because either they've had a good experience before or they don't see it as a complaining behavior. They see it as a feedback loop. Uh, and they are, in, as customers, intentionally or unintentionally trying to solve and close a provider gap. Then we have two, the higher levels. The irates are basically more likely to complain outside. One of the things about the irate is that it's quite likely that you can go and take a voicer or a passive, mishandle the service recovery, and create an irate that you've complained about something and the service provider's response has been very negative, service provider's response has been disproportionately aggressive, even proportionately aggressive. It has been the wrong response and you're not gonna give them a second chance, you're gonna go outside and you're gonna complain. The last level is over the top, but the activists, like the description of the activists is over the top, but basically this is also where Complaint has done nothing. You have engaged in the process and you as a service provider can create the activist customer by ignoring someone who is giving you feedback, 
The feedback is valid. There is a genuine grief. Ignoring it, downplaying it, or trying to dismiss that customer can escalate them to irates. Trying to dismiss the customer again can turn the irate into the activist. Instead of resolving the problem, trying to aggressively discount or discredit the customer tends to generate the activists. There's also the activists who are basically engaged in this activity because you're in the wrong. And the thing you need to understand is that the language here is very much a defensive language. The passive voicer irate activist. This is a very defensive language that the services marketing is using here. We could reframe these people as the silent, the proactive, or the silent, the active, the proactive, the third party. There are ways in which we can reframe and view this. So be careful when you're reading theory and when you're looking at this to say, how is this framed? Is this the best framing of the language? So what do we do with a service recovery? Well, the first thing is we fix the problem or we fix the customer. Now, in the notion of fixing the customer, remember that the customer is a co-creator and co-provider of the service. If something has gone wrong during the service, the customer is going to be, it's going to impact the customer. They're going to be affected by the outcome. So you need to respond quickly, which is the real liability has been broken. So you're looking at here at fast reaction. You need to show empathy and you need to show assurance. You need to demonstrate that actually, as well as solving this problem, what can we do to ensure that we have listened to you We've dealt with, and the customer will be emotionally compromised. That is a situation that you're going to deal with. It has gone wrong for them. Now, if they've come in with a very high expectation and they've got a very high gap between their expectation and their perception, they've got a lot of cognitive dissonance, and that cognitive dissonance will be resolving itself in distress, anger, or a variety of other emotional outlets. So your aim here is to try and refocus, get that service recovery in so they're now less focused on the initial service breach and more focused on the service recovery. You want fairness to be a key and equity factor here. And you also want to go and follow up. You want to have this as a moment where it's gone wrong, but you're trying to retrieve it and redeem it. So you're also wanting to make something that's no long-term impact. Be willing to walk away though. If it's gone wrong, the customer may just want nothing to do with it and may want to walk away. On the other side is fixing the problem. This is where we go, we understand that the customer has, been, has had an issue. We're trying to make things better for the customer. How do we fix their problem? And how do we ensure that this problem doesn't recur? So we're looking here at trying to at complaint management, tracking and learning from the complaints learning from lost customers if we have the opportunity to get feedback from them through market research and looking at what redundancies and fail sacks we can put into a service. So let's go through these points in a little more depth. In terms of fixing the customer, remember that the customer has by complaining invested time, ego and effort in you and your organization. They have gone and said this is important to me to let you know what's happening. So they're going to expect a response and they're going to want that response to be fast. Remember the complaint is central to them at this point in time. They want some degree of compensation. And if it's been a service failure, they've been inconvenienced. Also, a lot of customers are going to basically have felt that they've gone, when the service has failed, if they are complaining, they've gone out their way to help you. So you want to look at this from the point of view of you might be frustrated by the service failure, but you need to engage that customer to make certain that they are satisfied with the recovery. You want to treat customers fairly, and we're looking here at three levels of fairness. The outcome is the one that quite often services marketers focus and fixate on, but it's not necessarily the key idea. 
Procedural fairness and interaction fairness will make a difference to how people perceive an outcome. If during the process, the customer feels that you have listened to them, you've taken on board and taken them seriously, and that you are engaged in a fair, you're not trying to defend, deflect, or dismiss their complaint. You are trying to solve the problem that they now have of the service having gone wrong for them. The interactional fairness can actually be a huge impact so long as there is a fair outcome. Someone who has been given compensation to an adequate level and fairness will not be as happy as someone who has had Again, an equal level of outcome fairness, but a better interaction. So all three are important. It's not just enough to go, well, here's your money back. Get out. It's, what was your problem? Thank you for complaining. How can we help you? What would you, what, you know, how do you feel? Is, you know, we would like to refund you and offer you a special deal. Do you think that's adequate? Are you okay with that? So long as we basically engage with the customer it is effectively another selling moment. This time what we're selling is the importance of our relationship with that customer to that customer. And they're gonna be a hard audience. So once we've recovered the customer, we've sorted the problem out for the customer, part of what will be seen as fairness and procedural fairness is fixing the underlying problem. If you slip, you know, you have a slip and a fall in a supermarket because something was spilt on the ground. There are a lot of procedural elements that will be uh, addressed. One of them is going to be if you've gone, you know, you've walked down the aisle, you've slipped on a spilt sugar bag, you walk back, you know, you fill out your uh, paperwork that you've been compensated, you've been given your coupon for discount at the checkout, you walk back down the aisle and it's all, the spill's still there and it's still dangerous you're not going to feel that the problem was solved. You're going to feel that you were dismissed and the procedural elements will fall and will falter and the interactional elements will falter. So you want to fix the problem because the first thing is if there's been a services problem, it could be a systemic error. We have these quite a bit in any course and one of the things I really appreciate from my students is when you send me an email saying, can you clarify or asking detail about an assessment task, says to me, there is an error in how I presented the information that I can then fix. So when you share your feedback and your questions with me, it helps me improve the situation for everyone. So fixing the problem, learning. We can offer things such as the service guarantees, and I'll note that the key thing in all of the uh, a service guarantee is in a physical goods guarantee, we can give you another good. We can swap your phone for another phone. We can swap a book for a book. In a service, we can't swap a massage for a massage. It's like, well, look, I know you. Hi, oh, you came in for a massage and we dislocated your shoulder, but we'll give you another massage for free. You're not necessarily going to be quickly lining up to get make use of your free, possibly injurious causing massage. So what is it we can actually guarantee? We're trying to express an assurance that we will fulfill the conditions of the service. So what makes a good service guarantee? The first thing is it's got to be unconditional. It has to be a the customer is satisfied or there is a failure of the service. It needs to be something that the customer understands whether in fact you know, the guarantee should be invoked. Remembering that the service needs, if you're guaranteeing a portion of a service or part of a service, the customer needs to know what the boundaries are of that guarantee and the employees need to know what they're supposed to do. It has to be easy to invoke. You can't make it, for it to be an effective guarantee, it can't be an esoteric difficult process. It can't be log a complaint through 35 different stages hoping to exhaust the customer before the customer gets to the complaint. And in that case, if your service guarantee is too complicated, you've created a second service failure that will compound the customer's annoyance and anger. And the last thing is, it's gotta be meaningful. Guarantee that a service guarantee of, you know, 
you're going to guarantee on-time delivery. It's fixed. The it's fixed or it's free. Guarantee 25 minutes or it's free. On the airport, at the airport, buy the flight time, or we buy you another flight. Those are meaningful guarantees. If it the main guarantee was we'll deliver you to the airport, and if we miss if you miss your flight because of our driving, you get five dollars off. It's not meaningful. It's got to be contextual. It's got to be relevant to the problem that was created. So the service guarantee does some beneficial things, and they are a key point of this uh, conversation and this chapter. So I want you to have a bit of a look around them. What I'm looking for when you're looking when you see a list like the benefits and service guarantees, you're looking to say, what does this connect to in other parts of marketing? So a benefits list focuses on the customers. So you can look at consumer behavior theory, the broad principles of marketing, the market orientation. The guarantee becomes an invocation of service recovery. The guarantee becomes a feedback loop that you can learn from because if someone's had to invoke the guarantee, their service has been broken in a specific way or has been broken, therefore this customer is willing to complain because they can see a reward through the guarantee for their investment of their time and effort to communicate the problem with the service to you. Reasons you don't want to use a guarantee. The top of this list is great. Uh, it's one of my favorite things. You know your service sucks. You know your service is poor quality service and you don't care. Don't offer a guarantee because you don't give a damn. And you can do that so long as there's not a lot of competition or you've got a regional monopoly or there's some reason why being an unpleasant service provider is profitable to you. Um, there are other reasons. Look, sometimes the service quality is completely out of control. Like you cannot control the guarantee, you cannot guarantee the outcome. So you make that a feature. It's like, look, there are no guarantees because the risk is inherent. If it works, you are going to really enjoy this. If it doesn't work, well, it's the experience. It was worth a shot, wasn't it? Finally, don't put a guarantee down where there's very little risk in the service outcome because when a guarantee emerges in a low risk service, people start to think, why does it need to be guaranteed? And it raises the risk perception of the service. And finally, we mentioned back in customer complaints that you had an exit switch strategy as your option in the event of a service failure where you complained or you didn't complain. So what leads to service switching and perceptions of service failure are these component parts of price where you've, and you'll note deception, unfair is an equity issue, inconvenience, the service is not, is expensive from um, a time, effort or energy. Something goes wrong in the core service, you get billed incorrectly. Normally you get bit, a service failure comes about through you are billed more than you should be. But you can also have a service failure in reverse where you are undercharged. And I can actually speak from a personal experience of I was undercharged due to a, in a billing process so even if I wanted to pay the proper price to get access my full service, I was unable to do that until the service failure was rectified. So I could have been locked out of the service that I was trying to pay good money for because the billing system wasn't working. A service encounter failure is another reason, and this is the interpersonal. This is why people are such a critical part. You can go to a, you can be having a great experience with a service provider's products and then have a bad experience with one of the customers or staff. And at that point in time, go, no, I'm out. Doesn't matter how good that coffee is, I'm not going back there. That I'm not dealing with that barista again. The other side of the column here, response to service failure. So obviously, if your service has failed and you have had a poor response and you've gone there as a customer, it's been a poor uh, sense of satisfaction, you shop around and go somewhere else. Competition, 
you may actually find the relative benefit of a different service provider beats the benefits you're currently getting. So there's a relative advantage and you leave because and you're not leaving because the service provider's done anything wrong. A different service provider has done something better. So that's competition's challenge. Lastly, the ethics and the involuntary. The involuntary switching is that the service provider closes. And this is one of the ethicality, the ethicalities of pricing, where you don't price your service at a sufficiently high level, so you're unable to maintain your service, so you actually end up shutting down and not solving the problems that you'd previously been dealing with for your customers. So you're, you're underpriced and it was an unethical behavior because you're no longer in the market to solve the problems for this group of customers. The last point, the ethical problems, if it's lying, cheating, stealing, hard sells, the service is unsafe, there are conflicts of interest, there are a lot of reasons here. So you want good service to be ethical service and ethical service to be thought of inherently as good service because ethics matter. It's an interpersonal dynamic, it's an interpersonal relationship and it matters when you are dealing in services marketing because you're dealing with people and you're dealing with people as individuals. You may work for a firm, you may work under a banner and a brand, but you are still a person. So your service encounter and the service encounter failures and the ethics issues are all people led and people driven. So that's basically it for this chapter. It's a mid-length chapter. It is one of the key sets of ideas, the service recovery. So I'm going to ask you to really pay attention to this chapter, particularly around fixing the problem. So the service recovery strategies, we want to look at, I want you to self-direct your study to the fixing the problem section because I want you to be looking, when you're looking at that section, I want you to have a copy of the gap model with you. So print out a copy of the gap model, have a photocopy of it, whatever, and look at the service fixing the problem, say, well, which of these gaps do I need to close in order to do service recovery to fix the problem. And that's a wrap for this chapter. As always, if you need me, at Stephen Dan, stephen.dan at anu.edu, if you need to come and see me, book a time, uh, across the Waddle site. And one of the things I will say is that asking me questions and sending me emails and querying content isn't actually a service failure, it's a service, I, I regard that as you co-creating part of this service as well, in that the two-way interaction, the conversation that you give me and the questions you ask me, let me develop additional materials or additional ideas or different ways of presenting the material to you to enhance the experience for both of us. So please, if there is anything you need to know, feel free to ask.